Welcome to Episode 2 of Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Radio Edition. When we last left our heroes, Doc Danger had escaped from Professor Z's deadly trap and is now in hot pursuit of the Professor and his stolen blueprints. Josiah of the Jaguars and the Lady in Black have teamed up to recover the onyx gem of Zavanu from the Beetle Queen. And while Satellite Sally went off in search of kidnapped composer Robert Von Hesslington, Lunar Bandit Penny Dreadful and Professor Z have abducted and detained Sally's partner Claire DeLune in a super high-tech moon base. Will Claire escape from Penny's clutches? Will Josiah and the Lady retrieve the gemstone? Will Doc Danger stop Professor Z's sinister project uncreate before it's too late? Stay tuned, because all this and much, much more will be revealed in Episode 2, coming your way right now. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 6. History is written by the winners. Penny Dreadful adjusted her ten-gallon hat and smiled a crooked smile over Claire de Lune, who was now sprawled unconscious on the floor. It might have been a slight blow to Penny's honor, employing one of Professor Z's robots to take out Claire from behind, but ultimately, honor doesn't matter much when you're pumped full of laser shot. Besides, Penny figured, if Miss DeLune had had any sense, she'd have been flattened by a magno train long before showing up here. Impeccable timing, MC7. Take Miss DeLune to the lab and prepare her. Penny watched the lumbering machine drag the unconscious cowgirl down one of the Lunar Fortress's labyrinthine corridors. That was one enemy accounted for, but... What about her partner? Penny asked. The professor replied brusquely. We'll tend to her next. Don't worry, she's currently occupied on the other side of this headquarters, where she thinks our hostage is located. But we know better, don't we, Bobby? With a pompous grin, the professor turned toward Von Hesslington, just as the captured composer was being escorted into the room by Penny's other new ally, the diabolic Beetle Queen. His slender arms bound behind him, Von Hesslington was clearly in a state of severe agitation as he replied, Um, actually, I prefer Robert. Of course you do. Ah, did those two buffoons honestly think we wouldn't sweep for bugs? After all, we have the queen of the bugs right here. Please, Professor Z, my title is the Beetle Queen. Of course it is. Penny frowned, realizing it was going to fall upon her to play the peacemaker among their newly formed triad. She made a placating gesture as she spoke. Don't be such an uncivil cuss, Professor. We're all on the same side, right? Show some respect. I mean, how would you like it if we started calling you Mr. Z? I have a hunch that's more accurate anyway. You, Von Hesslington, will keep quiet. <laughs> You just don't strike me as much of an academic. <laughs> so I suppose the professor thing was just some sort of bizarre affectation. Shut up! Before Penny knew it was happening, Z had grabbed her favorite laser gun from out of her holster, and he now had it pressed against Von Hesslington's temple. There was a crazed look in the professor's eyes, which made Penny distinctly uncomfortable. Fortunately, before she or the queen could say anything, the insanity in Z's expression dissipated, and the tuxedo-clad man regained his usual composure. A gray cat wandered lazily into the room, purring as it rubbed against Professor Z's leg. Now then, our friend the Beetle Queen has outlined your assignment, yes? Von Hesslington spoke anxiously in reply. Yes, but <laughs> what you people are asking me to do... Well, it's insane. It could lead to unthinkable harm. Unthinkable? Well, I have no difficulty thinking of it, Bobby. I dare say that anyone who does is just suffering from a failure of imagination. MC7! Take him back to his little workspace and be sure to lock the door. It's iron feet clanking upon the marble floors of the fortress, Professor Z's robot servitor strode into the room, took the nervous composer in one of its tubular arms, and departed. As the echoing thuds of the robot's feet receded, Penny tentatively retrieved her weapon from Z's now relaxed right hand. Thanks, Prof. Uh, 
Hey, look, I don't mean to be a negative Nancy or nothing, but is that guy right? I mean, this whole project uncreate. It sounded like a good idea when you first explained it, but no one's ever done anything this huge before. Exactly. <laughs> Don't tell us that you're losing your nerve, my dreadful little darling. Well, it's just, if we do this, I reckon we'll be just about the worst villains ever. The whole world will look at us as the biggest monsters in history. Slowly, Z and the Queen turn first toward each other, then back at Penny with twin expressions of withering condescension. History! <laughs> History is dense, elaborate and immense, made of centuries of trials and tribulation. How can any person cope with the size and the scope of this overwhelming field of information? You could study, you could learn how to perceive, how to discern. Blech. Spare me all that blathering and prattle. For I know that in the end it will really all depend on which side wins the final closing battle. Once the campaign is completed and you're the only person seated on the throne, then you alone control the information traffic. Decide what's printed on each graphic. Dictate what they teach in college. Teach them or slow the flow of knowledge. Choose who's best and who to banish. Who will flourish and who will vanish. Decide which journalists will break news. Who ridicule the rest is fake news. Ha 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 ha. It's all up to you. You'll know what to do. Just appoint the people who will be listened to when the line is drawn between the saints and sinners. History is written by the winners. Once your foes are all defeated, then you will be the person seated at the head. And you can spread any kind of tale or story focusing on all your glory. Control the content of the media. Rewrite the encyclopedia, almanac, and dictionary. Choose what goes in each library. Edit school books down compactly. Until they match your thoughts exactly. <laughs> Owing to your fame, they will celebrate your name and believe your every claim because it's all a game. But it's not one to be played by beginners. History is written by the winners. History is vast cause it's filled with the past. All its tragedies and massacres and revels. All the best, all the worst stuff, nearly fit to burst with good and bad, with angels and with devils. But I myself have no fear of yesterday nor yesteryear, even though it seems unending or infinite. Now I know that the key to unlocking history is not to learn it, it's to win it. It won't matter if I cheat it cause I'll be the only person seated at the table So I'll be able to make each meaningful decision Like who they put on television, what gets shown in the theaters I'll appoint the commentators And if I learn any science that does not seem in compliance With my own foregone conclusion, I reject it as illusion <laughs> When it's said and done, I will be the one who decides how things are run and how the facts get spun, cause they'll be spun by my own designated spinners. History is written by the History winners. History is written by the 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 winners. History
Milwaukee Opera Theater wishes to thank Dr. Suzanne Walzak for her sponsorship in honor of her parents, John and Arlene Walzak, MOT superfans and patrons of the arts. And now, back to Doc Danger and the Danger Squad. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 7. Satellite Sally and the Smart Sensitive Feller. The office in which Robert von Hesslington was now forced to work was cramped, with only a single window offering a view of the moon's light side. But Robert ignored the vista as he sat at his desk surrounded by crumpled staff paper, science textbooks, and radios of various sizes, none of which currently offered up any kind of sound apart from relentless, uncomforting static. Robert was carefully drawing a quarter note into Measure 21 when he was once again struck by the enormity of what he had become involved in. He began to babble and then to cross out all the notes he had drawn so far. Is that... can I... no, no, no! It's it's insane! It's all just... Startled, Robert turned around and beheld a woman climbing through the window. Once she had emerged fully into view, Robert saw that she was dressed like a typical lunar pioneer. Blue jeans and a tailored shirt, a fringe jacket, and a silver belt with holstered laser pistols on either side. As she took a step toward him, the spurs on her high-heeled leather boots jangled. She fixed him with an intense glare, and Robert was struck all at once by the sparkle in her piercing eyes. Hey, feller! Are you Von Hesslington? Yes, and you're... Suddenly he realized she was the most intriguing woman he had ever seen. Oh, gosh. Who are you? They call me Satellite Sally. You already met my sidekick, Claire. But she's just a junior partner. I'm in charge. Okay. I came to break you out. Sorry it took so long. I didn't know a penny had taken that tracker off of you. Sally looked around the room, seeming to take in the surroundings for the first time. Penny? Miss, it's not just Penny Dreadful that you have to worry about. She's only one member of some sort of sinister triumvirate. They've- Say, I thought you were a prisoner. This looks more like an office than a cell. Whose side are you on, anyway? No. You see, it's their leader. A man who claims to be a professor. He's forcing me to compose a piece of music whose harmonic structure could destabilize the entire universe. Calm down, my friend. You're ranting. Maybe you just need some air. I am not ranting. Look, you're familiar with the solar system, right? Mercury, Venus, Mars, Saturn. Now don't talk down to me, mister. (laughs) Know them. I've been to them. Well, look. The distance of all of those planets from the sun conform to a certain set of ratios. It's a consistent formula of orbiting bodies throughout the universe. But those ratios can be found on a micro level as well. How do you mean? One example is music. Apply the exact same ratios in music and you get a series of intervals, creating a seventh chord, just like you'd find in uh, any blues song. Pythagoras called it the harmony of spheres. The Latin term is musica universalis, which translates as universal music. Well, if that don't beat all. You speak Latin? I thought your specialty was music. Well, actually, I've been classified polymaths. Savant in music, languages, electronics, engineering. Hot damn. You know... That's funny. I was just thinking how nice it might be to meet a smart fella like you. Really? But I digress. We were talking about the music of spheres. There are some more outre theories that suggest the intervals are fundamental to the universe's primal existence. So, if you change the harmonies, then you can alter the very composition of reality. You just need... Some way to broadcast the music across the proper frequency. Perhaps some sort of phase modulation apparatus. That will be quite enough, Robert. At the interruption, Robert and Sally both turned just in time to see the Beetle Queen with MC7 beside her. One of the robot's metal hands was raised. Sally reached for her laser-charged sidearms, but before she could draw, a bolt of electricity lanced out from MC7's palm and bathed the cowgirl in a corona of blue light. Robert watched, 
horrified as his would-be rescuer collapsed into a heap on the floor. The electrical bolt flared out of existence and MC7 lumbered over to the unconscious woman, gathering her into its riveted gray arms. Oh, Sally! My God, what have you done to her? Such concern for someone you've just met, Robert. Does someone have a thing for women in leather boots with spurs? <laughs> Kinky. Take her away, MC7. Silently obeying the Beetle Queen's command, the automaton strode from the room. Robert quaked with fear as he watched Sally's limp form carried away. Had it still been breathing? He turned back toward the insectile figure who towered over him. Did you... Kill? Both of those obnoxious hayseeds are still very much alive. We'll need them for the final phase of our plan. Robert breathed a sigh of relief as the armored woman drew a small piece of paper from a hidden pocket located somewhere on her glistening carapace. Speaking of which, Robert, I've come with a note from our mutual friend, Professor Z. <clears throat> Get back to work! Ta-ta! <laughs> Robert didn't bother to watch her go. Despairing, he returned to the desk, reaching for his pen and a fresh sheet of staff paper. This time, he didn't even have the wherewithal to begin drawing a single mark, as once again, the horror of his present situation crashed in on him. Make a note, quote Professor Z, unquote. He demands that I compose a piece that's built on certain ratios. Make a note, I don't even get a vote. I write as he cracks the whip, he dictates the tune. In this dictatorship, it's an unfair arrangement. I wonder how the undertones went wrong. This is a bad song, a very bad song. I'm given absolutely zero choice, forced to give this lunatic a voice that will echo for all time. This is a tune that will make all of creation ill An incurable malady An incurable malady An illness with no antidote Make a note The markings I put upon my staves Will flood existence under waves and waves, waves, and, waves, waves, waves and waves and waves And then comes a second universe A bit louder, a whole lot worse and worse and worse the proportions must fit like all the orbs in orbit. Worlds without must match the worlds within. That's the way the system's always been. The system of the heart, the system of the soul, the solar system as we know it. Is about to go, it will be all she wrote. Make a note. I've got no shot, no hope, no hope, no chance. Trapped inside this arrhythmic dance that no one will survive. One five sinister music to make all of creation sick. An incurable malady. An incurable melody, an illness with no antidote. Make a note, now it all sticks in my throat. Doing harm with harmony, as the lines approach infinity. No one can offer sympathy as I create an asymptote. My turns brand me a true turncoat. A man who rocks the boat and lets the world be ended. By remote. Make a note. note. And now a word from our sponsors. Doc Danger is brought to you in part by Chiropractic Health and Wellness, Bayview's full-service chiropractic clinic. 
Dr. Julie Vance utilizes a variety of chiropractic techniques to tailor a specific plan of action to meet your wellness needs. Visit bayviewchiro.com for more information or to schedule your first visit. And now, back to Doc Danger and the Danger Squad! Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 8. Congregation in the Danger Zone. Golly, these science journals sure are dry, Doc. The kids sat on the floor of the Doc's library, surrounded by several stacked piles of scientific texts, bound editions, and loose-leaf journals. Danger herself stood nearby, pulling yet more books off of one of the copious shelves that lined the walls of the massive room. Some she merely flipped through, skimming for relevant data with preternatural speed. Others she lingered upon at greater length, her brow furrowed in concentration, desperate for some clue. She replied to the kid offhandedly. True, but we need to figure out what Z is planning. Why don't we just call up Dr. Gilbert? I mean, he's the one who invented this anti-matter gizmo. I told you before, lose the anti-kid. It's called the Matter Phase Modulator. And William might know his machine, but he's still just a bookworm. He wouldn't be any help against a menace like Z. Still, he's a cute bookworm, isn't he? <laughs> And you sure do rescue him a lot. That's because he gets into trouble a lot. Listen, kid, after all this time following me around, you must realize that my first and only love is adventure. I don't have time to waste going dewy-eyed over a man, even a pretty one. Jeepers, Doc. I was just... That might work for other women, but not for me. You'll never see Doc Danger worshipping at the altar of a male. Got it? Besides, it's a moot point if we don't stop Z before he can put this plot into motion. Now, William said that his apparatus is designed to tap into esoteric energy sources. Esoteric? Strange, weird, bizarre. Energies that don't conform to the laws of physics as we understand them, so they seem less like science and more like... Magic, indeed. Danger and the kid both turned, startled by the unfamiliar voice. Holy crumbs! The kid exclaimed. Who are you? How did you get in here? With astonishing speed, a pistol was suddenly in the doc's right hand, and she leveled it unerringly at the woman clothed all in jet and onyx, who had suddenly appeared in the library without any warning. So this is the Danger Zone, legendary secret headquarters of New York's Doc Danger. How did you even find me? This fortress is buried five miles below the Adirondacks. My friend tracked your scent. The mysterious, ebon-swathed femme fatale tossed back her raven hair and looked up. Danger and the kid followed the intruder's gaze toward a corner of the ceiling. Another woman, clothed only in leopard-spotted scraps of fabric, was suspended there, observing them all with fierce eyes. Before anyone could say a word, she flexed the muscles in her arms and legs, let go of the walls to which she'd been clinging, and leapt. The feral figure soared through the air, somersaulting twice before landing on her bare feet with silent, cat-like grace. In the same fluid movement, she proceeded to execute a polite bow in the doc's direction. My apologies, Doc Danger, for intruding upon you uninvited, but the lady in black insisted that it was necessary. The doc smiled and relaxed her weapon. Jesai of the Jaguars, it's been a long time. And you... Danger turned then toward the other woman, having deduced her identity at last. So you're the mythic Lady in Black, Twilight City's most reclusive detective. Holy crumbs! The same Lady in Black who fought the super criminal that the papers named Lucifer? The papers named... Ugh. <laughs> Charming. Josiah addressed Doc Danger once again. The Lady in Black has divined the plans of your nemesis, Professor Z. He is going to use the modulation device to harness the energies of a magical artifact known as the Onyx Gem of Zavenu. The consequences of that could be disastrous. We need your help to stop him. Stopping Z is my primary agenda as well, but at the moment I'm not sure where he is. I went to the harbor to try and stop him catching a ship, but 
I must have been too late. My adversary, the Beetle Queen, also spoke of a ship just after stealing the gemstone. I made the same assumption you did, a nautical craft. We were wrong. Our rivals have taken a spaceship to the moon. Who told you that? The lady. The doc turned her attention briefly to the detective, who nodded once in confirmation. Josiah continued. She's had an augury. Z and the Queen are both headquartered on the new Lunar Frontier colony, along with one of the colony's more notorious bandits, a woman named Penny Dreadful. I see. And you need my help to get you from here to there. The Lady in Black spoke up then, addressing Doc Danger. You are the only person I know of with her own personal interplanetary space vehicle that she built herself from scratch. Very well. I'll warm up the rocket saucer. Josiah, do you want to borrow some attire that's more uh, substantial for the journey? I prefer to be unencumbered. The lady in black smirked. That works for me. Hey, wait a minute! Cried the kid. Are we going to fly into outer space just because the lady in black has a hunch? The ebony-clad detective's eyes narrowed into slits. We. Doc Danger spoke, breaking the tension. If the rumors are true, the lady here has dabbled in the occult. I'll wager her hunches are based on more than vague intuition. Smart bet. Unfortunately, the lunar colony is rather large. That's where our provocatively clad friend comes in. Josiah nodded, once again ignoring the lady's reference to her own chosen mode of dress, and spoke earnestly. My senses are more acute than any animal's. Doc Danger, once you've piloted us to the moon, I can track the scent of my arch-foe to wherever she and her confederates are sequestered. At which point, the Lady in Black can bypass any security measures they might be employing. There's only one person whose skills are not exactly essential to the mission at hand. Almost as one, the detective and the Jaguar princess turned toward the Doc's junior sidekick. The kid blinked, then blinked again. Huh? What are you saying? We're saying... Beat it, kid. No way! This is a major league mission and you need all the people you can get! You're not a people. You're a kid. I'm one of the founding members of the Danger Squad. Thank you very much. You two are just a couple of Johnny-come-latelys. Quiet, kid! Interrupted the doc. Then she addressed the lady in black. Look, I give the kid a hard time, but... The truth is she's got more moxie than any ten people twice her age. She'll pull her weight. I promise. The lady in black scoffed incredulously. <laughs> You're telling me this loudmouth, snot-nosed little juvenile delinquent, she thinks she's... Perhaps, friend, to argue this point would waste time that is better spent preventing the apocalypse? Fine. Doc Danger realized she needed to take charge or they'd never get underway. All right. Lady, Jisai, welcome to the Danger Squad. Let's prep for takeoff. Departure minus five minutes. The quartet headed down a corridor into the launch bay where Doc kept her incredible rocket saucer. They boarded swiftly and the Doc immediately took position at the helm controls. She flipped a few toggles and the craft began to hum, its miraculous engines slowly humming to life. The Lady in Black said nothing as she took a seat to the Doc's left, having apparently appointed herself Doc's co-pilot. As the Doc and the Lady began to proceed through a series of pre-flight checks, the Kid took the opportunity to get Josiah alone. She spoke to the Jungle Princess conspiratorially, not wishing to be overheard by the other women. Miss Josiah, if you don't mind me saying so, your friend's kind of... Harsh. Don't take it personally, child. It's her manner. She doesn't have much good to say about me. She doesn't say much about anything. She's taciturn, aloof. Like many who specialize in the unknown, she believes that knowledge is power. The more you speak, the more strength you give away. You sound pretty impressed with her, considering you've only known her for one day. She does make quite the first impression. At this point, I would cheerfully follow her into the abyss. Really? You're not scared? Whatever we find on the moon, it's probably going to be pretty dangerous. Dangerous. Oh, child. I go once more to wage a war as I have before in the earth's molten core for I am no stranger
danger to danger. This is Adventure. no worse than so when I dealt with the Egyptians curse. In a haunted pyramid, when I fought the queen, I had no choice but to succeed. And I did, yes I did. For I am no stranger to danger. So in a long, long line Like when I battled Red Rover in his mutant But it does not But the black spider in the valley of Vertigo Are dueled with the pirate king On the waters of danger to danger Whoa, whoa, whoa It's dark danger I killed the invisible man Fought the scarlet ninja clan in Japan I bested Monster Mickey of lust. You never told me about that one. Um, maybe when you're older. The point is, danger. Well, it's my last name, so obviously. I am no stranger to danger. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 9, The Matter Phase Modulator. In the vast, domed central chamber of his lunar headquarters, Professor Z stood, his heart stirring at the thought of his imminent victory, not only over his arch-foe, Doc Danger, but over the entirety of time and space as well. He was dressed, as always, in his perfectly tailored tuxedo, but over it he now also wore a ceremonial robe of the deepest purple. Tucked underneath one of his arms was his purring feline companion. Slowly, so as not to disturb his beautiful kitty cat, Z made a full 360-degree turn, taking in the fullness of this glorious ceremonial chamber, the ultimate monument to his unparalleled criminal genius. In the center of the dizzyingly large room, MC7 toiled ceaselessly, putting the final touches upon the matter phase modulator. It was a lovely device, which looked nothing like any computational apparatus Z had ever seen before. It more closely resembled a piece of sculpture with its various components connecting to each other at odd, counterintuitive angles, and various colored lights adorning it in mind-bendingly abstruse patterns. Yet it seemed that, no matter how or from what perspective a person might view the machine, all of its lines led the eye toward a small dais near the machine's center. It stood at about waist level, and its smooth, polished surface pulsed, almost anxiously, as though hungry for a final crucial ingredient. Professor Z grinned and reached into his jacket pocket, pulling from it a smoothly polished black gem, which the Beetle Queen had been so kind as to remove from the crown she'd recently retrieved from the volcanic tomb of some ancient king called Zavanu. Professor Z raised his voice and called out to his robotic servant. Excellent work, MC7. It matches the blueprints down to the last detail. Now if you would place this bauble into the center. The robot came forward and raised a tubular arm, allowing Z to drop the onyx jewel into its outstretched metal hand. 
MC7 turned then and clanked back toward the modulator so as to place the pitch dark stone onto the machine's waiting dais. The professor, meanwhile, looked to his right, where Penny Dreadful, now wearing a deep purple robe over her usual cowgirl garb, stood at an unassuming wooden table, fussing over five identical brass collars. Professor Z spoke brusquely to her. Dreadful! Did you program Bobby's song into the collars as I showed you? Of course I did! You reckon I'm stupid or something? Of course not, Penny. <laughs> Now then, kindly take two of those collars and attach one to each of your hillbilly playmates. Penny scooped up two of the brass ringlets and sidled from the room, while the professor lifted up his sleeping pet, allowing the cat's drowsy eyes to be level with his own. Z pressed his own forehead to the cat's and cooed affectionately. Ah, kitty! My plan approaches fruition, awaiting only the introduction of one final element. And that element ought to be landing right about now. <laughs> God, I'm good. Hide, MC7! Stealthily, we of the Danger Squad break into a sinister high-tech base. Who knows what form the danger will take when with it we come face to face. When with the danger we, when with the danger we, when with the danger we come face to face. Oh my god, did you hear that? Don't worry, squad, it was the cat. Yes, yes. It was the cat. Yes, yes, it was the cat. <laughs> Milwaukee Opera Theatre wishes to thank Nick Bernstein for his sponsorship. Thanks, MOT, for providing so many wonderful experiences to Milwaukee audiences. And now, back to Doc Danger and the Danger Squad. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Part 10, The Music of the Spheres. The kids sat within the rocket saucer's spacious cockpit, utterly annoyed. She didn't understand why the Doc had fought to allow her presence on this mission if at the last crucial moment she would simply make the kid wait inside the spacecraft, missing all the action. Restlessly, she stood and began to pace. What if the doc was in trouble? She'd never forgive herself if she hadn't been there to help. At last, the kid came to a decision. First, she grabbed her favorite cap from where it lay on one of the seats and secured it firmly upon her head. Then she proceeded to lift the hatch that allowed her egress from the doc's rocket saucer. The kid took a breath, then stepped tentatively onto the surface of the moon. It was beautiful just as she remembered it from the time she had helped the doc fight off the hypno-men of Promontorium. The kid made her way quickly toward the eastern wall of the moon base and entered via the hole that the doc had made earlier with her custom-built laser carver. Pushing her glasses up with a single forefinger, she squinted, realizing she was in a darkened hall. To her right, she could see that the corridor terminated at the entrance to... somewhere. Whatever that room was, she could hear multiple voices coming from within and also perceive a red glow emanating from it. As silently as possible, the kid headed in that direction. Once at the threshold, she held her cap to her head and peeked around the arched portal to discover the source of the scarlet light. What she beheld sent shivers down her spine. The dock, the lady in black, Josiah of the Jaguars, and a pair of women in Western Frontier regalia were all standing like statues in front of a large, complicated-looking machine. The lights adorning the bizarre apparatus seemed to be pulsing in time to the odd emanations of a smooth black gemstone that sat in the device's central dais. Tending to the machine was a robot of the same design as the one the kid had seen smashed up in Professor Z's last known hideout. Gulping in fear, the kid realized that the machine must be Professor Gilbert's phase modulator. As for the Danger Squad and the Cowgirls, they were all grimacing, clearly wanting but unable to move. 
Hovering about the quintet of women were a half dozen squares made out of light, all of varying sizes, and each one casting a sinister red glow. Somehow, the kid could sense that the arcane energies of those crimson squares were what held the women's collective power in check. Standing in between the captured heroes and the machine were a trio of sinister figures in purple robes. She recognized the man with the pencil-thin mustache immediately as Professor Z. Flanking him were two women who emanated malevolence, just as Z himself did. The woman to Z's left was wearing a 10-gallon hat and grinned a crooked grin while the one on the right towered over everyone else in the room, even if one ignored the two black antennae that protruded from her forehead. Pacing amongst the feet of the malign trio, somewhat incongruously, was a gray cat. She realized that Professor Z was speaking. She strained her ears to listen, hoping that his characteristic braggadocio would contain a clue as to how she might rescue Doc and the others. No! <laughs> Oh, you hero types! You fall for these booby traps every time! You may as well release me now, Professor Z. If you don't, I'll escape anyway. I always escape. Indeed you do. Did you think I hadn't noticed? Silly girl, I wanted you to escape from that pathetic death trap. Penny, the queen, and myself, we knew you'd all come charging in as per usual. So this time we decided, why stop you? Instead, we can use you. We needed a choir for our special song anyway. What more delicious irony than for that choir to be made up of our most hated foes? And what makes you think we won't escape this time, Z? Because any escape requires time, Danger, and you've run out of it! The clock is about to strike midnight, uh, lunar standard time, and then our ritual shall begin. The kid shuddered, remembering the phrase that the Lady in Black had spoken back in the Danger Zone, Project Uncreate. She watched in terror as the villainous in the cowboy hat went to the five captured women and toggled a switch on a brass collar that each of the prisoners wore. Once she was done, all five collars glowed faintly, and the mouths of Doc and the others seemed to open against their collective will. What had the professor said about needing a choir for a special song? The kid couldn't take this any longer. She had to do something. She crept into the room, doing her best not to be seen by the purple-robed triumvirate, nor the robot that was guarding the phase modulator. She knew that somehow that onyx gem was the key. If she could remove the stone from the machine, she might just be able to prevent whatever apocalyptic nightmare that Z was planning to bring about. She moved with agonizing slowness, creeping closer and closer to the device, praying that everyone else in the room would be too absorbed to notice her. She formed a picture in her mind of herself, successfully plucking the jewel off of the dais and stuffing it into her cap. As she tiptoed ever nearer to her goal, she tried to focus on nothing but that single mental image. Meanwhile, she was dimly aware of the sound of Jazai's voice as the jungle princess pleaded with Professor Z. Professor Z, I urge you not to tap into the power of the gem. It could plunge us all into unthinkable disaster. Unthinkable. <laughs> How amusing. That's the same word Bobby used. Perhaps, Josai of the Jaguars, you, just like the good Mr. Von Hesslington, simply suffer from a failure of imagination! Oh, you arrogant do-gooders! You came blasting up here in your flying saucer, no doubt boasting as you did so of your penchant for defying peril, and you never realized that you were my pawns every step of the way. Your overconfidence was your undoing. You and all your vigilant peers. Now you're here before us, we will add you to the chorus of the music of the spheres. Yes, the triumph I have been pursuing. 
I can sense that finally it nears. The moment is impending, I can hear it in the wending of the music of the spheres. So danger, this is it. The final chapter's writ. I've won, you must admit. At the strike of the clock, my good doctor, the world gets a shocking blow. So forgive me while I crow. Yes, the universe will be undergoing a realignment of its primal gears. According, According to, to our, our pleasure, we will rewrite every measure of the music of the spheres. The sorrow in your souls is showing. Your position is as weak as it appears. As you stand there sadly moaning, we will readjust the tuning of the music of the spheres. The battle's finally won. The current age is done. A new one is begun. Oh, I can scarcely believe or conceive that at last I'm achieving this. I am drunk with bliss. <laughs> The clock has struck! Trigger the harmonics! The colors activate, machines initiate, project uncreate. On cue from your throat comes a note that Von Hessel and wrote for in the key of C. Now these complex electronics powered by the gem of onyx transform the group harmonics into cosmic level ultrasonics to destabilize realities moment sees the culminating fusion of all my plots and plans throughout the years. My enemy supplying and the black jewel amplifying the music of the spheres. This at last is the conclusion. Let it flood your mouth and eyes and ears. My victory knell is ringing in the overwhelming singing You have been listening to Episode 2 of Doc Danger and the Danger Squad, Radio Edition. Check back next week for Episode 3, to be released Thursday, July 9th. Doc Danger and the Danger Squad is an original production of Milwaukee Opera Theatre, with book, music, and lyrics by Jason Powell. Our stage director was Jill Anaponisic, with music direction by Donna Kummer. Sound engineering by Rick Probst and Adam Kutashat. Foley artistry by Mike Ding Lorenz with additional effects by David A. Robins. Doc Danger was played by Brianna Rose Lepore, Josiah of the Jaguars, Stephanie Stasek. Satellite Sally was Carrie Gray, Claire DeLune, Hannah Esch, The Lady in Black, Ray Elizabeth Perry. Professor Z was played by Eric Welch, The Beetle Queen, Anna Gonzalez, Penny Dreadful, Becky Kofta, Robert Von Hesslington, Siobhan Jackson, MC7, Katie Gruel. The Kid was played by Harper Navin. The narrator was Jason Powell. Join us next week for more action, adventure, and the third installment of Doc Danger and the Danger Squad.